Good afternoon and welcome to the Alex Rubina Radio Show. We're broadcasting live from Newhall, California, right here in your hometown station, KHTS. Joining me in studio is my uh, lovely co-host, Ellen Tunick. Thank you for being here today. We also have a special guest. Her name is Erin Aquaviva. Erin, thank you for being here today. Appreciate you taking the time. Um, today, uh, this is a beautiful day of recovery and healing. Um, just 30 hours after one of the most horrific acts of violence that uh, Santa Clarita has ever experienced. And I want to discuss possibilities of why somebody would ever think of hurting another person in such a horrific act. Um, and just open up a discussion because I think that um, in the recovery and healing process, people are in search of trying to find the why so that they can grab on to uh, a reason that makes sense to them so that they can um, keep moving on in this uh, recovery process and the grief, hopefully getting to a stage where once you get the why, once it makes sense to you, that um, you can get to a stage of acceptance and get on through the, the grief process in a healthy way. And uh, Aaron, you join us today being a uh, perseverer of the Las Vegas uh, shooting, uh, mass shooting that happened in 2017. And uh, I was hoping that you could share a little bit about uh, the needing to know why and, you know, what I like to call, uh, you know, it's like when you have that experience, you go into like junior reporter mode and you start searching through all the Internet and try to go through all the facts and try to figure out why. Is that something that you went through as well? or? I think my my process with why was very fast. Can I interrupt you just for a moment? I'm so sorry. We're going to go to uh, breaking news right now. Uh, stand by. We, I think this is important information for our community. Okay, well. All right, so what we're doing is we're waiting for a press conference right now that uh, we're going to be – uh, po uh, apparently getting more information about what happened. And maybe this is part of the why, right? This is part of the process. Absolutely. So so my experience with the why, um, being somebody who's gone through an experience of running from an active shooter, um, was fairly quick. Uh, working with, with young people, especially on, you know, emotional growth and emotional wellness, my why was already... This is a this was a human that was suffering, mm. and there are a lot of humans that are suffering. So my why was really quick, and then came the healing. Once I answered that why, um, I watched my husband do like you said, the internet digging, because it's like until you can figure out and make sense of it and wrap your brain around it. It's almost like you can't take the next step. Yeah. Do you like believe that there are answers out there? You just have to find them. Is that the mentality of the search? I, I think that is the mentality yeah. of the search. If, but the answer is different for everybody. Right. So, um, so like I said, for myself, it was it was very quick. This was this was a suffering human being. Um, and, and then for my husband, who maybe is more of the rational brain or logical brain, he needed some hard you, facts everyone. about why or how this could happen. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to that press conference now. Stand by. I want to provide you an update of the tragic events from yesterday. And first and foremost, I want to extend my condolences to the families and the victims all involved. And our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone. We've reached out to the, the families of the six uh, victims and uh, five of them have uh, do not want to release information to date. They're still trying to reach far-flung relatives, so we're holding off on that. However, the family of one of the deceased has uh, provided that information, and we're sad to report that Gracie Mule Berger, a female, 15 years of age, was the one who succumbed yesterday at 9:23 in the morning from her injuries. And her parents, Cynthia and Brian, obviously devastated, and we're with them. And it's um, it's a tough day here in Santa Cruz. So um, we have, uh, as we have more information on the other victims, we can release that. But to date, we're going to respect their privacy. We're not going to go there. The um, the suspect condition still remains critical, 
and hasn't changed and uh, for that uh, we'll hold off it's a uh, this is a tough day when you think about it I'm a father I'm a grandfather my grandchildren are the same age of the ones who uh, were victim of this uh, senseless act of violence it still remains a mystery why so I just want to encourage everyone grab your kid hold them a little tighter and make sure they do the right things when they're in school and if God forbid they haven't in this type of circumstances follow the directions run if you can't run hide if you can't hide then you you do something you fight back and the kids in the school yesterday did all of the above they did as they were trained we had an active a shooter drilled just in the last few weeks at the school and we had evidence that the kids ran as they were told to run kids that barricaded themselves they sheltered in place they covered the windows propped the door shut and they did exactly as they were trained and that definitely assisted and then when the time came to provide aid to those who were injured they took them in and they provided first aid while they were waiting for our first responders so uh, kudos to all of them for for a job well done and hopefully it's a job we never have to do again now I want to bring uh, Captain Ken Wergener to provide us update on the status of the investigation and we also have some updates from our special agent from the ATF, uh, Special Agent Canino. Let's start with uh, Captain Wigner. Antes de, de empezar eso, déjeme ofrecer información en, espa en español. El PSM lo extendemos a todas las víctimas, todas las familias de los fallecidos y los que quedaron heridos. Y reportamos que la niña de 15 años, Gracie Mule Berger, Fue la que falleció ayer. Es estudiante de la escuela de Saugus, escuela secundaria. Sus, sus uh, papás, Cynthia y Brian, obviamente, es, es, están sufriendo la, lástima, la pérdida de su hija. Y estamos nosotros ofreciendo el todo el apoyo que podamos. El sospechoso sigue en estado crítico en el hospital. Y no tengo nada de ofrecer en, en diferencia en eso. Tenemos información nueva. Y el detective de homicidios, el capitán Ken Wegner, va a ofrecer esos, esos datos. Y también el agente del ATF especial, el agente canino, va a ofrecer más detalles con respecto a la investigación de eso. Y para nosotros tenemos información que todos los niños en la escuela hicieron toda la capacitación que ya se había dado recientemente. Los que tenían, pudieron correr, huir del, del peligro, lo hicieron como fueron entrenados. Los que no pudieron huir se, eh, se enforzaron dentro de las escuelas para prevenir que un sospechoso entrara a la escuela. Cubrieron las ventanas con papel para prevenir eh, ver las personas dentro de la clase. Hicieron todo lo que tenían que hacer en su entrenamiento. Y, y es una prueba de que este tipo de capacitación, capacitación sirve sirve un propósito muy bueno y queremos extender las gracias a todos los que hicieron todo lo posible para ayudar a los afectados en esto y ahora voy a, a cambiar al inglés and uh, let me switch to English now and uh, Captain Wigner Good morning, Captain Kent Wagner from Sheriff's Homicide I wanted to update you on the investigation as we know it today at, at 12 o'clock I referred yesterday in the press conference to an Instagram account that we were attempting to verify whether it did or did not belong to the subject in this shooting. Uh, after working with Facebook uh, overnight, we have determined that the account was not linked to the subject. Uh, the account was subsequently deactivated by Facebook for violation of its Facebook rules. I can't get into at this point um, where the, it originated Suffice it to say that it was out of the country. We continue to work with Facebook to identify any further accounts that may belong to the suspect, and uh, we have search warrants pending on that. To, to date, we have conducted over 40 interviews, and we have about six pending. At this point, after evaluating the information obtained from those interviews and from the various sources and the scenes of our investigation, no motive or rationale has yet been established for the subject's assault. Suffice it to say, we did not find any manifesto, any diary that spelled it out, 
any suicide note or any writings which will clearly identify his motive behind this assault. We have conducted, as I said, over 40 interviews. However, I want to reiterate that if there are people out there, students or administrators, people that had information about this subject or the incident yesterday, please call Sheriff's Homicide at 323-890-5500 so that we can arrange an interview with you and we can learn what you know. The firearm used in this assault is currently at the Sheriff's Crime Lab. We will be collaborating with agents from the ATF to research and analyze that weapon as well as its origin. The main crime scene where the assault occurred in the quad at Saugus High School has been processed. All evidence has been collected and documented. In fact, a 3D scan was performed this morning to document the entire crime scene. And it has just been cleaned by a, uh, by a cleaning company and released back to the school district so that it can be occupied. Uh, I understand that school is canceled for the day, so um, hopefully somebody from the school district can talk about the future plans for next week. And that's all I have right now, and I'd like to interview, introduce somebody from the ATF to comment. Sheriff, thank you. Thank you, Cap. Then my name is Carlos Canino. I'm the special agent in charge of the ATF Los Angeles Field Division. Um, I just want to briefly discuss what ATF's role in these types of incidents are, uh, what we did yesterday to assist uh, our partners at the Sheriff's Office, uh, and where we're at now. So ATF's role in these types of incidents is to assist a local jurisdiction in ascertaining uh, where weapons, or the weapon in this case, uh, originated from. Uh, we do that in any of these mass shootings or school shootings. That's, our, that's ATF's primary role uh, in these types of incidents. What we did yesterday was agents responded uh, immediately to the scene. Some of our agents integrated with uh, sheriff's deputies uh, and trying to locate uh, suspect, and uh, we integrated with the homicide unit in trying to uh, identify the origins of, of that firearm. Uh, ATF traced six firearms, uh, which all have been accounted for. Uh, we have provided that information to the sheriff's office. Um, As we speak right now, ATF agents are at the Sheriff's Office Crime Lab working with, with Sheriff's personnel there and trying to identify the origins uh, of this gun. Once that happens, obviously the Sheriff um, will brief you as to the origins uh, of that firearm. And that's where we're at as far as ATF goes in this investigation. Thank you. Okay, next up to the podium is going to be the Mayor of Santa Clarita, Marsha McLean. Hi, good afternoon. Um, this morning, as we all wake up, woke up, we all felt that it is now a reality in our, in our, in our city as to what happened. I want to acknowledge the bravery of the students of Saugus High School who went through this and those that came to their aid. We are a very tight-knit, family-oriented community, and we are all family. And when something happens to one of us, we all feel it as well. It, this has had a very far-reaching occasion for our entire city. Um, as I speak to our residents, we are all feeling what happened, and the entire community has been affected. I do have some information that I want to give to our community. To begin the healing process, we will be gathering as a community this Sunday night at Central Park at 7 p.m. 
Central Park is located at 27150 Bouquet Canyon Road in Santa Clarita. This vigil will be a chance for all of us to heal together, to support each other, and to stand as a community united. We will be providing lights in the blue and silver of Saugus High School, so please do not bring candles. It's not necessary. You will all be having a light in silver and blue to commemorate and to celebrate Saugus High School. For more information on this vigil, please visit the city's Facebook page at City of Santa Clarita. In addition, we want you to know the city has postponed our annual tree lighting ceremony in Old Town New Hall, Light Up Main Street, to next Saturday evening, November 23rd. We are working closely with the William S. Hart Union High School District, our public safety officials, our local hospitals, faith-based organizations, and other local agencies to provide the resources our community needs to heal. We are in the process of launching a website that will be a central landing place for all resources, support organizations, and information for our community. The website will be launched later today and will be located at saugusstrong.org. That's .org. I encourage all of you who are sharing messages of support on social media to use the united hashtag saugusstrong. We have a lot to process, obviously, in the coming days, weeks, and months, but we will get through this all together. We are Santa Clarita, and we are Saugus Strong. Thank you. Back up to the podium is going to be Sheriff Alex Villanueva. As I mentioned yesterday, the first responders on scene were off-duty peace officers. And I have with me today Detective Danielle Finn. Where are we? Come up. And Deputy James Callahan. Detective Finn is a Santa Clarita right here, a station detective. And Deputy James Callahan is our school resource deputy for Santa Clarita. And what they did yesterday was extraordinary, along with Officer Sean Yanez from Inglewood PD and Officer Gus Ramirez from LAPD. So if you have any questions of them, uh, please feel free to, to reach out to them and uh, they're, they're willing to answer any questions or any questions you may have of us today. That was, uh, I was getting information from the site, from the hospitals, and from the investigators on scene, because we had, we had eyewitnesses at the shooting, and we also had the description. And welcome back to the Alex Rubina radio show. Uh, for those of you that were listening to the press conference, um, I think it's important to have shared that press conference, at least in the beginning. And then for those of you that need that, that's part of the why, I think, is to gather some more information. And a lot of press conferences um, in the next couple of weeks are going to be important uh, so, so that you can gather enough evidence to, to try to complete your why so that it makes sense to you. So if um, you still need more, just go to your television, open up any local news station, and you might want to uh, continue to watch that. But for the moving forward on the show, I want to just discuss a little bit more so we can open up some possibilities to help people heal with discovering what the why is for them so that it makes sense. And even though we might not be able to find a valid why to make sense to justify any horrible acts of, of hurting other people or any violence, I don't want you to see it in the word, in the distinction of trying to justify because that's not what we're doing here. We're trying to give you a possibility of looking at it from an understanding of why he, what would have caused somebody to do this, um, so that you, so they can help uh, give you a tool to help move you forward and free you up. Is that kind of how you saw it when you decided uh, what your why was? Did it did it help you kind of free you up to be able to move on to the next stages of healing? Absolutely, that was the first step. Is the why and and wherever that comes for people, I would say. Do what you need to do and be where you need to be in your process. And if your process is researching and finding that why for however long it takes so that you can take that next step, 
do that. Listen to the pref press conferences. Watch the news. Do what you need to do. Same with the students that went through this. Um, and everybody's process is going to look different. So my why came quickly. For my husband, it was a little bit, you know, it took a little bit longer. And his healing process took, I would say, a little bit longer. And everybody is going to have that process. Um, yeah, it's a it's a individual uh, journey that each person so is going to have to go through. Yeah, absolutely, and it looks different for everybody. For me, it was a lot of tears and it inside myself, and and for some, it's you know going out and doing something that you love and um, being you know being around people that you love, and so and and a million different things in between. So I want to point out then uh, as an invitation for people that are in that process of grief and a healing to not compare yourself to someone else's process. If someone else that was standing right next to you that witnessed the same thing is all of a sudden is moving a little bit faster or a little bit slower, we're, we're, we're not going to be judging each other. We don't need to because it's an individual, it's like a custom uh, process for each one of us to get ourselves um, unstuck so that we can get down that road of healing a little faster. Yeah, we are all so individually made and individually wired for the same reason some of us will, you know, fight or flight. Some of us will fight and some of us will fly depending on certain situations. We're wired differently. We're, we're made up beautifully and differently and everybody's process gets to be honored. Um, I think that's the tough part. There's an expectation about what the healing process looks like. And if we can let go of that and, and honor everybody's process and how they heal and be there for one another and be, be a human being. Yeah. And I think we also have to be compassionate for the process that we're all in. For example, some people right now are very angry and they're going to ling They're going to linger in that anger for a while. We can't take it personal. Um, like I've been noticing on social media, you'll get people that will project their anger onto others. Um, whether it's comments uh, right. about what people are sharing or what people are saying, if they don't hear what they want to hear it or it doesn't make sense to them, they're already throwing in their, their anger, you know, directing it towards people. So one, you can't take it personal and you got to be compassionate that that's, that's the stage they're in and you got to create a, a safe space for them to get it out, uh, verbalize it. Some people are going to verbalize it in, in different ways, but I want to describe that that's a normal process. That's the natural pro progression of one of the stages. And anger is sometimes a tough emotion. For It has many triggers for many of us, um, but it's, it's there. It's all a part of the grieving process. Anger is there. So if we can hold a space for people to vent that out as well as uncomfortable as it might be for us individually, um, just allowing for that process for people because on the other side of that is healing. Yeah, and then some people are in denial still. They're still yes. operating from the, I can't believe it happened right. to us. I can't believe it, that, that, that it happened at all. I can't believe that, you know, society is that, you know, hurt and broken. And I can't, so you're stuck in, the, I can't believe it. So that's that, that denial phase. That, well, it, it breaks the, it, it cracks the shell of, I live in a safe community. That's right. And, um, I think people are going to have to challenge themselves to understand understand that um, because we do have a very, quote, safe community. What happened yesterday makes us all feel less safe, especially our kids. Um, so it's a conversation to have, you know, is how do you, how do you, how do these kids feel safe again? Yeah, and I and I think when you talk about safety, that's one of the grieve the the grieving right. processes, the loss of safety and security, especially in a place that you've decided is your safe zone. Now it's different if there's loss of safety at a, a sporting event, right? And you go in there, you prep yourself for that. Like, okay, I'm going to this event. I got to be mindful and look around and see what's going on. But in your own sandbox is where you feel violated you feel like it's like having somebody uh, break into your home and steal something or somebody steal something violation. from your car you just you walk in and you just feel like it doesn't it's unsettling i no longer feel safe in this area so we're gonna have to figure out how to gain that back and it's a process it's a, a minute by minute moment by moment day by day process of 
figuring out how to get ourselves back to that place. So I want to talk about some possibilities and the possibilities are the whys. And it's not just one why, it could be multiple whys. It can be multiple components of what could be happening with people um, that they get so distraught that they feel like they have to take their anger and their and and hurt other people. So in the last day and a half I've been on the on the show, when people have been asking me why, uh, my common response back is the the why that I grabbed onto, and for me it's a statement. And it's uh, it's called hurt people hurt people, and it's the it's the idea or the concept that when you're hurt, lost, and broken, and you've gotten to the place where you're hopeless, uh, there's some people that decide that they're going to bring that and cause that same pain onto others. And so that's how they choose to act out is to cause pain on others. It's like, um, it's like okay, if I'm not going to win, no one's going to win. And so that, that's, their, that's their last stand that they're going to take their last action. And so is it possible that we have lost, hurt, broken people in this world that when they get hopeless, that they just choose to act out and take that cause pain onto others. Well, absolutely. I think that was a very similar why to me is that these are emotionally hurting people, human beings that, I mean, I, I personally feel a responsibility to be better for them, you know? And, um, and, and, and that is my why, that these are hurt people. And how do we heal? How do we heal? How do we heal our youth, too? I mean, that's the part that I think breaks my heart more than anything is that these are kids. Yeah. And so if there are hurt people that are choosing to hurt other people, um, I take my own personal experience of, you know, 25 years of working with teenagers um, in a beautiful powerful inspiring weekend where kids are vulnerable enough to share and reveal and and do some healing some cathartic healing um i've come to the conclusion that more and more children through the years are slowly shutting down their emotions they're not feeling their feelings and experiencing their experiences and most of them from my experience it seems like they're living up in their head it's like they're 90 10 um, and I, my journey and my uh, vision is to help wake up more kids and, and teach them the value of operating from my heart, uh, being in touch with my spirit voice, uh, you know, uh, feeling my feelings and learning how to be an emotionally healthy, competent leader in, the, in my life. Um, and so there are times, and i got to share and be honest with both of you guys, because you've both been in my trainings before. There are moments where if I have a 1,000 kids coming through my training in a year, there will be about two or three of them out of those thousands that really concern me. Like I can see a future mass shooter in our trainings. They'll come through because they are shut down and disconnected. They're almost robotic. Mm -hmm. And it brings me so much joy to see some of those kids for the first time in their life experience love or a belonging or to feel like they do matter. And it's not coming from their family or people that love them the most. It's coming from a group of people that have decided that everyone matters. And so when stuff like this happens, it reminds me that there's more work to get done love. and more kids to love to and let them know that they, they, they matter and they're important because this is, this is how we as human beings can, can cause the shift is to bring more love and, and to acknowledge and make eye contact with more kids when we're passing by them, just stopping and saying, Hey, you know, I like what you're wearing or just having a conversation, just letting people know that I'm seen. I'm seeing you. Hey, I'm here. Yeah. And how many times do we talk through people or over people and we never really stop and really just connect with people? I think more than ever, this work that you do and this message that you speak of acknowledging people and taking time to have that human connection is so important because we're living in a world where it's so easy to disconnect. Um, kids are up against social media, um, all kinds of technology where 
takes them away from that one-on-one experience. That human connection. They don't even know. So if we can cause it in any way, like you said, decide that I'm going to compliment two kids today or five kids today or as many kids as I come into contact with, I'm going to get down on their level and get on a knee with them and just have a conversation with these human beings that are so important. I think if we can decide to do that, to make one choice, to make one difference, it's so important in this world where we just connect so easily. And it's okay if it's just one person. I think so many people go, well, what can I, what can I do? You know, it's so pervasive. It, you know, it's so big. It's so big. It's bigger than I'm me. I'm just one person. Right. Well, that's okay. It's okay if it's just one person. Because maybe that one person then goes to the one person, goes to the one person. It doesn't matter. One person's good. One of the things that really um, excited me was yesterday I was having a conversation with Joe Messina, who's part of the uh, school district. And he was talking about something that I didn't know existed. And I don't know if it's a program that's currently happening or, but he spoke about a group of people who are in the school system, in the schools, on the campus, who are looking for the loners, the ones that are disconnected, the ones that have given up hope and appear like that to them. And what they do is apparently uh, they invite them into a class or they purposely walk up and give them one-on-one time. They're making that kind of difference. And I don't know uh, if it's really a program that happened or is not being funded anymore. But when he said that, my, my eyes lit up. And I was like, that's what we need. We need more funding going to programs where we can have mindful people that are walking around that have intuition, intu- intuitiveness. Or teachers. And, and that yeah, can say, that can hey. identify a kid like that to go, yeah. hey, this kid... Um, not put them in a box because no, we don't want to no. box them. We just want to say it appears like um, I can't get to his heart. Right. I can't feel her when she's talking. And so if we can identify those people and slowly come up and create an, a relationship with them so we can mentor them. I think we'll see a huge shift in humanity because um, the way we're going right now with technology and the conversations about and being more successful and make more money and pressure, be smarter pressure, pressure. is and look is, good and look good is all okay. about it's all about the superficial stuff and we're no longer creating deep meaningful uh leaders in our kids that have huge hearts um and it's the disconnection that we have slowly not recognized in our kids that has them numb out and not really care for my neighbor not really care for the kid who's struggling or is getting bullied and I can just walk right by and not say anything. We're slowly numbing out those emotions and, and, and the thing that makes us special. Absolutely. And I think that's why it's our responsibility to see it. It's, it's, it's hard generationally, right? Challenging. It's challenging generationally. (laughs) Uh, because I did not grow up where we went outside, we played together. That's where we learned. We don't. I we didn't don't grow understand up with this it. world. But I, right now. I, I am. This is my commitment to take this right. on. It's the world that we live in. Right. Kids are faced with it. It doesn't make them bad and wrong. It's the world they live in. Right. So now, how are we going to shift how we approach kids and the? captive audiences in our schools and how we approach kids and having that social emotional component and i know schools are starting to have those conversations and um these messages are coming through we have these things happening in our schools as horrific as it is what happened it's also a constant wake-up call to all of us that these kids are suffering out there they don't know how to ask for help they're supposed to be cool and they're supposed to be strong and we don't give them any space to be anything but that. And not only do they not know how to ask for help, some of them don't know they need help. Some of them don't know they're struggling. Some of them don't know that they're deficient emotionally and spiritually. They think uh, and mentally. just like everybody else. They think that because they have enough knowledge and because they know it up here, that it transcends in relationships and in self-worth. They don't know the value of connecting and self-love 
most parents don't know that. You try to explain that to them. They go, oh, my son doesn't need that. He's good. He's got a smile on his face. He's the captain of the football team, and she's the cheerleader. And so the kids are really good at masking that because – um, that's what they've been taught. They've been taught to smile and perform in front of the camera. They've been taught to act as though my life is all got it going on and pretend like, like the old fake it till you make it. Yeah. The problem is, is that as long as you're faking it and you never make it, then you're devastated. Well, and they have this platform where it's always faking it, right? Social media. I was you just going to say. No, there's no coming to a place where Okay, I faked it, and now I didn't make it. No, I could just keep faking it. Yeah, right? who's I can know. I could just keep making it look pretty. I'll make pretty. those pretty pictures, and yeah. right. So again, that's where I think it comes our responsibility to be that example for them, which means tapping into our own vulnerability and tapping into our hearts. And sometimes, you know, when it's been a lifetime of not doing that, there's some hurdles to overcome and but they get to see that too mm -hmm. absolutely they get to watch that process they get to watch us falter and make mistakes and own them cry right cry and and be human beings yeah absolutely so let's go through some possibilities of of why would somebody do this kind of horrible act towards other people could it be that uh, people like that feel hopeless like there's no more hope for me and so I've given up and they've collected evidence that it's true, that no one cares. Um, no one asked me how I'm doing today. Uh, people walk right past me and don't even look at me. I'm so invi- I'm invisible. I'm invisible. And so when we feel hopeless, um, it's very easy to hit the end of our rope where we just get angry. And now we want to turn our anger and put it onto someone else. Could it be that some of us have a deep emotional pain? that our parents never uh, taught us how to move past. They've never taken us to therapists or taught us what uh, therapy is, how valuable it is. Uh, We don't have parents that are competent enough to open up discussions in our living room uh, because they're afraid that they have to do something about it or don't know what to do about it. And and or they're trying to, or they, they want to try to fix it. Um, But, but could we have uh, kids that are, have um, deep emotional pain, that they haven't let go of, they haven't made sense of. Um, could some of our kids also have a resentment that they're holding on to towards a dad who maybe walked out of a marriage or a mom who wasn't there for them one more time in my life? And so if we have built up resentment and anger and hopelessness, you, you stack all that on top of each other. And it, now you have it, your case. It paints a picture for someone who is desperate enough to say, my life's worthless, and so I'm going to take my own life. But before I do that, I'm, bringing you with I'm gonna. Yeah. if I can't win, no one can. And so hurt people end up hurting people. And it's this idea, I mean, could, could one of the whys be that the only way I can get this message across is not just to take my own, but is also to take those great of point. others? Great point. It's a great point that, that a lot of these people – are actually saying they're, they're, they're sending a message to the rest of humanity. But yeah. the question is, is are we open to hearing that message, which is if I'm not going to win, no one wins, or, hey, this, I'm, I'm in pain, and I've been in pain, and no one's watching, and no one's paying attention, so I have, I'm going to cause trauma and hurt, and I'm going to take people with me. Or... Are we listening to other stuff like uh, gun control and politics? And and I'm not saying, please don't jump on social media and start bashing me and saying that that's what it is. I'm not disagreeing with you. All I'm saying is, is can we be open to that? It's multiple things. That that could it be possible that There's our that layers, layers, and layers and layers and layers. And so today we're just talking about one, and it happens to be the only one that I have experience with. Right. If I was, um, you know, in the gun world or if I was in a, you know, one of the other layer worlds, I would be talking about that. But but I'm just sharing today that I see thousands of kids a year who have that are struggling. And it's and it's and it's sad because, like I said, through the years, I've watched the kids shut down and be disconnected from 17 to 15. I'm going into tween trainings with seven year olds that can't cry. Seven-year-olds who who are numb—they're like they're like they're like baby robots, 
and it's heartbreaking because their magnificence and their true joy and their true wisdom and all of their spiritual answers are right here and they've shut it down when they were maybe five years old for whatever reason or when they were six. And so if that's not a statement to wake up and go, hey, world, your, hey, ki- world. your kids are hurting and they need, they need um, some healing. They need um, leaders have decided to build them up, to inspire them. Or just mirror your own self-worth to them. Mm-hmm. Have conversations. I think one of the greatest things you could do is have a conversation with a kid. A random kid even. Hey, tell me what you like. Tell me what, what you love. Or, hey, I saw you doing that skateboard. That's pretty cool. How long did it take you to do it? What? Oh, yeah. it was it. And if, You know what I'm saying? You're watching his or her face light up. And it's like that's how you build up our kids in our, in, our, in our village. It's like watching a small child learn to walk. That's right. That's how you build up our kids in our tribe. Find someone else's kid and create a moment where you just hear them out. Ask them a question. Let them tell you their story. And so I think if enough of us do that, we can start healing, uh, starting with our family first. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing profound about you being this amazing person making a difference out in the world with other people's families. If it's not at home. If your family's broken. So start with your family, with your kids, and open up. Uh, this discuss these powerful discussions so that your kids can heal themselves through these discussions. Absolutely, and I would even go a step further to say start with yourself, because we all we all need healing. That's we right. all do. That's right. And no matter how much we get, we need more. Yeah. And if we can keep healing ourselves and honoring ourselves and loving ourselves, then we can. And that's forever. Then we can heal our families and yeah. our kids and honor them and love them. And then but the average can, person, if you ask them how much they love themselves. They're going to tell you a 10, a 10, zero out of 10. They're going to tell you a 10. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's this great illusion that we love ourselves more than we really um, consciously realize. It's like if you ask them, what does that really even mean to you? That's right. That's right. It means different things to different people. So if I said, do you love yourself? Zero, 10, you're going to go 10. And then my next question is going to be, are you open to that? There's a 20. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the 20, are you open to that? There's a 30. And so, if, if you give yourself permission to have the courage to say, you know what, I'm going to start healing my, my, my family, and it starts with me, and I get to be that courageous leader that shows them what that looks like, and I'm going to start taking classes or reading books, and then I'm going to bring all that knowledge and those breakthroughs and that new awareness and share it with my son. Hey, kid, did you realize i got to share something with you? I was talking to my coach or my therapist or a friend, and I had an epiphany. And the epiphany was that I'm responsible for your dysfunctions. Your kid's going to look at you and go, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you had to learn that somewhere. You had to learn some. And, and the only person that, that you belonged to as your teacher since the day you were born was wow. moi. Yeah. And so maybe I didn't love you enough. Maybe I didn't give you enough attention. I didn't put my eyes on you enough. And so I take accountability for that. And that's what I learned today at class or with my therapist or whatever it is. And your kid's going to go, what? And then so what you're going to do is by virtue of inspiring him by your journey of personal growth and responsibility and discovering and healing yourself, by virtue you teach them that that's what we do in our little village. That's what we do in our home. So, if, like, if you come to my my home and you ask my kids to sit down and have a conversation, they're all going to sit down, plop on the couch, you know, grab their little, you know, snack, and they're going to be talking to you because that's just what they were, that's what they were invited to do because I was invited in when I was young, and it's just a culture that you have to start developing a new culture, and I'm afraid that the cultures that we're developing now is to hide out on our phones, oh. and finger point, and blame, and blame, and say mm-hmm. you know, or or think that that the answer is out Somewhere there else and not inside rather than here. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or want to be right. There's a lot of that needing, mm-hmm. not even wanting, but needing to be right and not listening. We're not listening to each other. Yeah. Yeah. And especially our kids. When kids say you don't understand, you need to stop and say, you're probably right. And there's a help good po- me, and there's and there's a good possibility we're not being present with our kids. Yeah. Because you can be here, but not really be here, listening from, uh, you know, you, you know what that looks like. It's when someone's talking and you're up in your head thinking of solutions, 
rather than actually well, just listening to what they're saying. Well, agenda you have rolling yeah. in your head. Yeah. Yeah. You're We're not, all guilty of it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I have to check myself all the time. All the time. Yeah. And I often have to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to like reground myself and say, okay, let's start, let's start over again. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I have to I'm get really off sorry. processing what I was just working yeah, on before. I was already pulling up my defenses of what you were saying. Mm, nice. Mm, yeah. You know, um, so, but we can, because they do the same thing. They're not actually all the time listening to what we're trying to share. They're also up in their heads. Yeah. So sometimes we have to ask, you know, woohoo. You know, and I, I think a lot and even this kind of leads into the healing process, too, is just a lot of holding that space for them and not coming at them always with I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you. Right. Come to me when you're ready and I'm going to hold that space for you and I'm going to be here for you and allow you to have an open, honest conversation about where you're at. But when they do come from you and you're sitting there working on the million dollar idea for your company, and you you, you, you got to go. drop everything swivel your chair, make eye contact, shut your brain off, turn your heart on, and then listen and engage and be present 150%. Because if you don't, what they end up doing when you're going, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, they're, they're creating limiting beliefs that my mom doesn't care, I'm not that important I, to my dad. They're not interested. And these limiting beliefs is what shapes their re- own reality of self. And so we got to really be mindful of those moments because if we're not – we don't realize that thousands of interactions of, with my son or daughter of me not being fully present is a byproduct of why he or she doesn't um, want to listen to me, um, just gives me short answers, uh, goes hides out in their room. You, you got to be open to the possibility that who you are being or not being in the thousands or hundreds of thousands of interactions with them has caused them to, to see you in a specific way creating these limiting beliefs about you, them, their rela- our relationship, even what's possible, right? So now I want to ask, as we open up the possibility of could these people that are causing harm, uh, doing these uh, horrible acts of, of violence onto other people as being possibly hopeless, right? Um, the experiencing deep emotional pain, no longer able to love, feel love, or feel lovable, is that possible? Absolutely. What about um, having um, some emotional inadequacies? Um, I never, I'm underdeveloped emotionally because I just never learned it. I never, I never knew. Didn't experience Because I was it. seven years old. I was 13 years old. My parents never talked to me about my emotions. I didn't know that, that I needed to develop that until now I'm in my 30s or in my 40s having been divorced two or three right. times. Now I'm suffering. Yeah, and I'm an alcoholic and I want to kill myself, right? So hopelessness, um, experiencing deep emotional pain, no longer able to love or be lovable, emotionally inadequate. And then what about just being disconnected for people for such a long time? What does disconnection create? Disconnection creates a shutdown of those emotions, right? If you're not in relationship to anybody, how are you experiencing yourself? Yeah. And so if we're disconnected from people, it might look like we're connected, though. Because there's a lot of people in the world that use words and conversations to feel like they're connecting with you. But if your heart's not turned on, they're just – words are em- babbling. Words are empty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, babble, babble, blah, blah, blah. Words are empty. And there's a lot of narcissistic tendencies in people to learn how to be in relationships, but the magic's not there. There, you've seen, you've been in conversations with narcissistic people, right? Absolutely. They're, yes. they're, they're lit up and they're happy and excited for you. And you think that they're feeling that you buy into it. You buy your hook, <laughs> line and sinker, hook, Absolutely. line and sinker until something later on down the line, you go, Whoa. wow, that was all an act. Well, I say, I always refer to that as form and no substance. Okay. Empty shells. Empty shells. There's you a know, lot of great em- form. Yeah. All the charismatic. That's people right. In the That's world. right that draw people to them and they're charismatic and the form is spectacular, but there's no substance. Underneath yeah. It. So if we look at these kids that are doing these, either committing suicide because it's not, this isn't just about grabbing a gun and, and causing a mass shooting. No. This is about even the suicides that the kids are having. Those kids are just decided they got into this place and they're just going to take their life, but they're not going to hurt anyone else. Right. This kid, yesterday decided to take his own life 
I believe that he wanted to take his own life anyways. I do too. But decided to take someone with him or as many people as he could with him to cause the pain in people from the, if I can't win, no one can win. <laughs> but my guess, my question is, and I already know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways because it's important for you guys to self-reflect and then give your own answer. If these kids are having these emotional inadequacies, inadequacies don't they grow up to be adults? And don't adults have these same inadequacies as well? And then have kids. <laughs> <laughs> and on and on and on. And, and don't know what they don't know. Mm-hmm. And are some of these people beautiful human beings and great yes. people? Absolutely. All of them. <laughs> All of them are beautiful human beings. They love their family. They just don't know what they don't know. And that's, hmm, maybe... Maybe there's some truth to um, in my emotional tank, I've only developed 30% of it. And maybe because my mom and dad, they never healed themselves and they never learned how to develop their emotional uh, fulfillment and their spiritual fulfillment. And so I only got, I only learned what my parents taught me. And then I never had a mentor who pointed that out to me that I need to, that that's important. Until I'm 40 or 50 or 70 paying huge prices at my deathbed looking back going, man, you know what? Maybe if I would have developed that part of me, maybe I wouldn't have struggled so much. It's hard. It's uh, What you're talking about really is breaking the cycle. The cycle of being disconnected. The cycle of not connecting head and heart. Um, And if, if we can expose people, children little ones, older ones, to how that happens, what that looks like, because it can be done. Um, I think that's such a benefit with what, what you guys do. We can break that cycle. We can help them understand that it can look a different way. It doesn't always have to look like this. And I think in this moment right now is that opportunity, Yes. right? We are all on a certain level very vulnerable. And if we can use this as an opportunity to connect with one another, we see it happening. We see this community coming together in love. We see parents hugging their children and loving on their children as they just break down in each other's arms. This is the opportunity for us to connect as as people are vulnerable as a a community, but within our families too. Yeah. And take those moments with our children. And use this as a time where everybody understands this is what this is when you break down. Yes. You know, when something like this happens and allow ourselves to have that breakdown, allow ourselves to embrace our children and be sad and 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 share our feelings and be vulnerable. Use this. So I hope that those of you that were listening today and have been traumatically affected by what happened yesterday, your um in whatever phase you're in when it comes to the grief and the loss, whether you're angry, whether you're in denial, um, or in search of the why, and, in, and, and that you heard today that um, the process is going to be unique for everyone. And wherever you are at in the process, it's okay. There's no right and wrong to it. As long as you don't try to compare it, if you try to compare it, you're going to find a, this is good, this is bad, this is right and wrong. Then the judgment will come out. But give yourself permission to look for your why so you can piece together something that makes sense to you so that you can go, it is what it is. This is what I've decided it is, and now I'm ready to move on. And that can come in stages. Like right. you said, you just you just went there right away. Not everyone's lucky enough to be at that stage in their life or in their involve, involvement. Some people take some weeks, months, years. Some never get that completion. Never. Some people get stuck on the. It's still not good enough for me. The why, and so they get they get linger they linger in that. How to forgive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so well, someone asked me yesterday about forgiveness, and I I kind of brushed it off, and I said that's a stage that you have to evolve to. Well, you don't. We could talk about it. Don't a certain behavior. No, no, I know that. But what I'm saying is forgiveness is a stage of evolving. You got to get to a certain level of enlightenment to where you see forgiveness as a tool to set you free. Because some people see forgiveness as I'm validating what you did to me is okay, or what you did to me is that it's not that that it's you know it's not acceptable. Acceptable. Mm -hmm. But forgiveness is really for ourselves to set ourselves free so we can get out of here. 
Um, thank you guys for listening. Uh, our prayers and our love goes yes. out to yes. everyone who Absolutely. was affected by this. If, if it wasn't, we would not be feeling your pain. Um, but we feel it just like we were there with you. We feel it just like your kids were going through it. And I'm so sorry that you went through that experience. And I'm here for anyone that needs it and wants it. And I want to thank you guys so much for listening to the Alex Urbina Radio Show right here in your hometown station, KHTS.